Section 19 of Agatha Webb. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. Agatha Webb by Anne Catherine Green. Chapter 18, Part 2 Some Leading Questions. Good morning, gentlemen said he advancing into their midst with an air whose unexpected manliness disguised his inward agitation the few words i have just heard miss page say interest me so much i find impossible not to join you amabel upon whose lips a faint complacent smile had appeared as he stepped by her glanced up at these words in secret astonishment at the indifference they showed and then dropped her eyes to his hands with an intent gaze which seemed to affect him unpleasantly for he thrust them immediately behind him though he did not lower his head or lose his air of determination is my presence here undesirable he inquired with a glance towards his father sweetwater looked at if he thought it was but he did not presume to say anything and the others being too interested in their developments of miss page's story to waste any time on lesser matters frederick remained greatly to miss page's evident satisfaction did you see this man's face mr courtney now broke in in urgent inquiry her answer came slowly after another long look in frederick's direction No i did not dare to make the effort i was obliged to crash too close to the floor i simply heard his footsteps see sí, now muttered sweetwater but in so low a tone she did not hear him she condemns herself there isn't a woman living who would fail to look up under such circumstances even at the risk of her life knapp seemed to agree with him but mr courtney following his one idea pressed his former question saying was it an old man's step it was not an agile one and you did not catch the least glimpse of the man's face or figure not a glimpse so you are in no position to identify him if by any chance i should hear those same footsteps coming down a flight of stairs i think i should be able to recognize them she allowed in the sweetest tones at her command she knows it is too late for her to hear those of the two dead sables growled the man from boston we are no nearer the solution of this mystery than we were in the beginning remarked the coroner gentlemen i have not yet finished my story intimated amabel sweetly perhaps what i have yet to tell you may give you some clue to the identity of this man ah yes go on go on you have not yet explained how you came to be in possession of agatha's money just so she answered with another quick look at frederick the last she gave him for some time as soon then as i dare i ran out of the house into the yard the moon which had been under a cloud was now shining brightly and by its light i saw that the space before me was empty and that i might venture to enter the street but before doing so i looked about for the dagger i had thrown from me before going in but i could not find it it had been picked up by the fugitive and carried away annoyed at the cowardice which had led me to lose such a valuable piece of evidence through a purely womanish emotion i was about to leave the yard when my eyes fell on the little bundle of sandwiches which i had brought down from the hill and which i had let fall under the pear tree at the first scream i have heard from the house it had burst open and two or three of the sandwiches lay broken on the ground but those that were intact i picked up and being more than ever anxious to cover up by some ostensible errand my absence from the party i rushed away toward the lonely road where those brothers lived meaning to leave such fragments as remained on the old doorstep 
beyond which i had been told such suffering existed it was now late very late for a girl like myself to be out but under the excitement of what i had just seen and heard i became oblivious to fear and rushed into those dismal shadows as into transparent daylight perhaps the shouts and stray sounds of laughter that came up from the wharves where a ship was getting under way gave me a certain sense of companionship perhaps but it is folly for me to dilate upon my feelings it is my errand you are interested in and what happened when i approached the sable's dreary dwelling the look with which she paused ostensibly to take breath but in reality to wait and criticize the looks of those about her was one of those wholly indescribable ones with which she was accustomed to control the judgment of men who allowed themselves to watch too closely the ever-changing expression of her weird yet charming face but it fell upon men steeled against her fascinations and realizing her inability to move them she proceeded with her story before even the most anxious of her hearers could request her to do so i had come along the road very quietly said she for my feet were lightly shod and the moonlight was too bright for me to make a misstep but as i cleared the trees and came into the open place where the house stands i stumbled with surprise at seeing a figure crouching on the doorstep i had anticipated finding as empty as the road it was an old man's figure and as i paused in my embarrassment he slowly and with great feebleness rose to his feet and began to grope about for the door as he did so i heard a sharp tinkling sound as of something metallic falling on the doorstone and Taking a quick step forward, I looked over his shoulder and spied in the moonlight at his feet a dagger so like the one I had lately handled in Mrs. Webb's yard that I was overwhelmed with astonishment and surveyed the aged and feeble form from the man who had dropped it with a sensation difficult to describe. The next moment he was stooping for the weapon with a startled air that has impressed itself distinctly upon my memory and then when after many feeble attempts he succeeded in grasping it he vanished into the house so suddenly that i could not be sure whether or not he had seen me standing there all this was more than surprising to me for i had never thought of associating an old man with this crime indeed i was so astonished to find him in possession of this weapon that i forgot all about my errand and only wondered how i could see and know more fearing detection i slid in amongst the bushes and soon found myself under one of the windows the shade was down and i was about to push it aside when i heard someone moving about inside and stopped but i could not restrain my curiosity so pulling a hairpin from my hair i worked a little hole in the shade and through this i looked into a room brightly illuminated by the moon which shone in through an adjoining window and what did i see there her eye turned on frederick his right hand had stolen toward his left but it paused under her look and remained motionless only an old man sitting at a table and why did she pause and why did she cover up that pause with a wholly inconsequential sentence perhaps frederick could have told frederick whose hand had now fallen at his side but frederick volunteered nothing and no one not even sweetwater guessed all that lay beyond that and which was left hovering in the air to be finished when alas had she not said the day and the hour what she did say was in seeming explanation of her previous sentence it was not the same old man i had seen on the doorstep and while i was looking at him i became aware of someone leaving the house 
and passing me on the road uphill of course this ended my interest in what went on within and turning as quickly as i could i hurried into the road and followed the shadow i could just perceive disappearing in the woods above me i was bound gentlemen as you see to follow out my adventure to the end but my task now became very difficult for the moon was high and shone down upon the road so distinctly that i could not follow the person before me as closely as i wished without running the risk of being discovered by him i therefore trusted more to my ear than to my eye and as long as i could hear his steps in front of me i was satisfied but presently as we turned up this very hill i ceased to hear these steps and so became confident that he had taken to the woods i was so sure of this that i did not hesitate to enter them myself and knowing the paths well as i have every opportunity of doing living as we do directly opposite this forest i easily found my way to the little clearing that i have reason to think you gentlemen have since become acquainted with but though from the sounds i heard i was assured that the person i was following was not far in advance of me i did not dare to enter this brilliantly illumined place especially as there was every indication of this person having completed whatever task he had set for himself indeed i was sure that i heard his steps coming back so for the second time i crouched down in the darkest place i could find and let this mysterious person pass me when he had quite disappeared i made my own retreat for it was late and i was afraid of being missed at the ball but later or rather the next day i recrossed the road and began a search for the money which i was confident had been left in the woods opposite by the person i had been following i found it and when the man here present who though a mere fiddler has presumed to take a leading part in this interview came upon me with the bills in my hand i was but burying deeper the ill-gotten gains i had come upon ah and so making them your own quoth sweetwater stung by the sarcasm in that word fiddler but with a suavity against which every attack fell powerless she met his significant look with one fully as significant and quietly said if i wanted the money for myself i would not have risked leaving it where the murderer could find it by digging up a few handfuls of mould and a bunch of sodden leaves no i had another motive for my action a motive with which few if any of you will be willing to credit me i wished to save the murderer whom i had some reason as you see for thinking i knew from the consequences of his own action mr courtney dr talbot and even mr sutherland who naturally believed she referred to zabel and who one and all had a lingering tenderness for this unfortunate old man which not even this seeming act of madness on his part could quite destroy felt a species of reaction at this and surveyed the singular being before them with perhaps the slightest shade of relenting in their severity sweetwater alone betrayed restlessness knapp showed no feeling at all while frederick stood like one petrified and moved neither hand nor foot crime is despicable when it results from cupidity only she went on with a deliberateness so hard that the more susceptible of her auditors shuddered but crime that springs from some imperative and overpowering necessity of the mind or body might well awaken sympathy and i am not ashamed of having been sorry for this frenzied and suffering man weak and impulsive as you may consider me i did not want him to suffer on account of a moment's madness as he undoubtedly could if he were ever found with agatha webb's money in his possession 
so i plunged it deeper into the soil and trusted to the confusion which crime always awakens even in the strongest mind for him not to discover its hiding place till the danger connected with it was over ha wonderful devilish subtle eh clever too clever were some of the whispered exclamations which this curious explanation on her part brought out yet only sweetwater showed his open and entire disbelief of the story the others possibly remembering that for such natures as hers there is no governing law and no commonplace interpretation to sweetwater however this was but so much displays of feminine resource and subtlety though he felt he should keep still in the presence of men so greatly his superiors he could not resist saying truth is sometimes a stranger than fiction i should never have attributed any such motive as you mentioned to the young girl i saw leaving this spot with many a backward glance at the hole from which we afterwards extracted the large sum of money in question but say that this revering of stolen funds was out of consideration for the feeble old man you describe as having carried them there do you not see that by this act you can be held as an accessory after the fact her eyebrows went up and the delicate curve of her lips was not without menace as she said you hate me mr sweetwater do you wish me to tell this gentleman why the flush which notwithstanding this peculiar young man's nerve instantly crimsoned his features was a surprise to frederick so was it to the others who saw in it a possible hint as to the real cause of his persistent pursuit of this young girl which they had hitherto ascribed entirely to his love of justice slighted love makes some hearts venomous could this ungainly fellow have once loved and had been disdained by this bewitching piece of unreliability it was a very possible assumption though sweetwater's blush was the only answer he gave to her question which nevertheless had amply served its turn to fill the gap caused by his silence mr sutherland made an effort and addressed her himself your conduct said he has not been that of a strictly honourable person why did you fail to give the alarm when you re-entered my house after being witness to this double tragedy her serenity was not to be disturbed i've just explained she reminded him that i had sympathy for the criminal we all have sympathy for james Sable, but i do not believe one word of this story interposed sweetwater in reckless disregard of proprieties a hungry feeble old man like Sable, on the verge of death could not have found his way into these woods you carried the money there yourself miss you are the Shush, interposed the coroner authoritatively do not let us go too fast yet miss page has an air of speaking the truth strange and unaccountable as it may seem Sable was an admirable man once and if he was led into theft and murder it was not until his faculties had been weakened by his own suffering and that of his much loved brother thank you was her simple reply and for the first time every man there thrilled at her tone seeing it all the dangerous fascination of her look and manner returned upon her with double force i have been unwise said she and let my sympathy run away with my judgment women have impulses of this kind sometimes and men blame them for it till they themselves come to the point of feeling the need of just such blind devotion i am sure i regret my short-sightedness now for i have lost esteem by it while he with a wave of the hand she dismissed the subject and dr talbot watching her felt a shade of his distrust leave him and in its place a species of admiration for the lithe 
graceful, bewitching personality before them. With her childish impulses and womanly wit, which have mystified and have imposed upon them. Mr. Sutherland, on the contrary, was neither charmed from his antagonism nor convinced of her honesty. There was something in this matter that could not be explained away by her argument, and his suspicion of that something he felt perfectly sure was shared by his son, toward whose cold, set face he had frequently cast the most uneasy glances. He was not ready, however, to probe into the subject more deeply, nor could he, for the sake of Frederick, urge on to any further confession a young woman whom his unhappy son professed to love, and in whose discretion he had so little confidence. As for Sweetwater, he had now fully recovered his self-possession and bore himself with great discretion when Dr. Talbot finally said, Well, gentlemen, we have got more than we expected when we came here this morning. There remains, however, a point regarding which we have received no explanation. Miss Page, how came that orchid which I told you wore in your hair at the dance to be found lying near the hem of Patsy's skirts? You distinctly told us that you did not go upstairs when you were in Mrs. Webb's house. Oh, that's so, acquiesced the Boston detective dryly. How came that flower on the scene of the murder? She smiled and seemed equal to the emergency. That is a mystery for us all to solve, she said quietly, frankly meeting the eyes of her questioner. A mystery it is your business to solve, corrected the district attorney. Nothing that you have told us in support of your innocence could, in the eyes of the law, weigh on one instant against the complicity shown by that one piece of circumstantial evidence against you. Her smile carried a certain high-handed denial of this to one heart there, at least, but her words were humble enough. I am aware of that, said she. Then, turning to where Sweetwater stood lowering upon her from out his half-closed eyes, she impetuously exclaimed, You, sir, who, with no excuse an honorable person can recognize, have seen fit to arrogate to yourself duties wholly out of your province. Prove yourself equal to your presumption by ferreting out alone and unassisted, the secret of this mystery. It can be done, for, Mark, I did not carry that flower into the room where it was found. This I am ready to assert before God and before man. Her hand was raised, her whole attitude spoke defiance, and hard as it was for Sidwater to acknowledge it, truth. He felt that he had received a challenge and with a quick glance at Knapp, who barely responded by a shrug, he shifted over to the side of Dr. Talbot. Amable at once dropped her hand. May I go? She now cried appealingly to Mr. Kearney. I really have no more to say, and I am tired. Did you see the figure of the man who brushed by you in the wood? Was it that of the old man you saw on the doorstep? At this direct question, Frederick quivered in spite of his dogged self-control. But she, with her face upturned to meet the scrutiny of the speaker, showed only a childish kind of wonder. Why do you ask that? Is there any doubt about its being the same? What an actress she was! Frederick stood appalled. He had been amazed at the skill with which she had manipulated her story so as to keep her promise to him, and yet leave the way open for that further confession which could alter the whole into a denunciation of himself, which he would find it difficult, if not impossible, to meet. But this extreme dissimulation made him lose heart. It showed her to be an antagonist of almost illimitable resource and secret determination. 
I did not suppose there could be any doubt, she added, in such a natural tone of surprise that Mr. Courtney dropped the subject, and Dr. Talbot turned to Sweetwater, who for the moment seemed to have robbed Knapp of his rightful place as the coroner's confidant. Shall we let her go for the present? he whispered. She does look tired, poor girl. The public challenge which Sweetwater had received made him wary, and his reply was a guarded one. I do not trust her, yet there is much to confirm her story. Those sandwiches, now, she said she dropped them in Mrs. Webb's yard under the pear tree, and that the bag that held them burst open. Gentlemen, the birds were so busy there on the morning after the murder that I could not but notice them, notwithstanding my absorption in greater matters. I remember wondering what they were all pecking at so eagerly. But how about the flower, whose presence on the scene of guilt she challenged me to explain, and the money so deftly reburied by her? Can any explanation make her other than accessory to a crime on whose fruits she lays her hand in a way tending solely to concealment? No, sirs, and so I shall not relax my vigilance over her, even if, in order to be faithful to it, I have to suggest that a warrant be made out for her imprisonment. You are right, acquiesced the coroner and turning to Miss Page, he told her she was too valuable a witness to be lost sight of, and requested her to prepare to accompany him into town. She made no objection. On the contrary, her cheeks dimpled, and she turned away with alacrity towards her room. But before the door closed on her, she looked back and, with a persuasive smile, remarked that she had told all she knew or thought she knew at the time, but that perhaps, after thinking the matter carefully over, she might remember some detail that could throw some extra light on the subject. Call her back, cried Mr. Kearney. She's withholding something. Let us hear it all. But Mr. Sutherland, with a side look at Frederick, persuaded the district attorney to postpone all further examination of this artful girl until they were alone. The anxious father had noted, what the rest were too preoccupied to observe, that Frederick had reached the limit of his strength and could not be trusted to preserve his composure any longer in face of this searching examination into the conduct of a woman from whom he had so lately detached himself. End of section 19, part 2 of some leading questions. Recorded by Gaby Cowan.